it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Maria Bonet, who have done so much work in uh, proof complexity on uh, structural industrial instances for SAT, on bounded arithmetic, and uh, nowadays on MACSAT. I can't even um, find kind of one specific sentence to say what you're working on because you're doing so many things. So Maria is um, in Barcelona, uh, at uh, UPC Barcelona, and um, you, you know, I'll just let Maria speak. Okay, thank you, Antonia. Okay, so, well, I'm going to concentrate on a particular encoding, dual rail encoding, and I'm going to talk about advantages and limitations. Um, and this is joint work with Sambas, Alexei Ignatiev, Joao Marquez Silva, and Antonio Morgado. Okay. So, um, well, uh, basically the motivation uh, is, uh, okay, so SAT solvers uh, are very important because many problems can be encoded into them. And, uh, but in general, SAT is a very difficult problem to solve, but, you know, some industrial problems are solved very quickly, but not some other problems, okay? And we don't have good tools for things, uh, for instances like, for instance, the pigeonhole principle and other problems like that. Okay, and also, um, uh, well, uh, people are trying to develop like solvers based, you know, different than the ones based in conflict-driven class learning. Uh, maybe to complement this type of solvers, you know, so that they can solve other types of instances. And they're trying to see if stronger systems than resolution can, and not too strong, otherwise it would be hard to find, um, say, refutations, uh, stronger systems than resolution to, to solve some difficult problems, okay? So, Okay, this, this is basically the motivation. Okay, so Ignatiev and uh, Barquez, Silva and Morgado, okay, uh, thought of the approach of uh, doing the following encoding. Okay, so I don't know why they called it dual rail. Okay, but um, basically they, they take a formula that they wanna know, uh, they wanna prove for instance unsatisfiability they encode it uh, and they transform it into a MaxSat problem, okay? And they solve it with some MaxSat tool, okay? So there are good things about these uh, encodings. Well, they're polynomial size. We can use MaxSat algorithms like core guided or minimum heating set, etc. okay, that are already implemented. And, uh, and we can solve hard problems that we cannot solve with um, resolution or CDCL um, SAT solvers. Okay, and I also wanna talk a little bit about what the power is of this dual rail MaxSAT technique compared to other proof systems. But the main, uh, the main objective today is talk about encoding. So that will be the center of the talk, okay? So um, we're going to use partial MaxSat, okay? So we need to give weights to the clauses uh, and the weights indicate the cost of uh, falsifying a clause. We're gonna partition the clauses into soft and hard. The soft are the ones that we may falsify if we have to, and the hard clauses are the ones that we must satisfy. So soft clauses in our case will have Weight one, okay, so if some subclass uh, at some point must be uh, falsified, then that will have the penalty of one. And the hard clauses may not be falsified and, and we have like a weight of infinity, for instance, okay? So partial max side is the problem of finding an assignment uh, for a formula that satisfies all the hard clauses and minimizes the number of falsified soft clauses. Okay, 
So this is the definition of the, of the dual rail encoding, okay? So our formula originally has variables x1 to s, s, xs, okay? And we're gonna encode it with a different set of variables, okay? So we're gonna have variables n, n1 to ns, for instance, and p1, p sub s. So the meaning of n means that the variable is negative and the minimum of p is that it's positive, okay? So pi is true if and only if xi is true, that's the meaning, and ni is true if and only if xi is false. So p for positive and n for negative, okay? So um, we're gonna take our set of clauses, okay? And translate the following way. So whenever we see an unnegated, a positive variable xi, we're gonna substitute it for not ni. So it's not positive. No, it's not negative, excuse me. And if we have xi uh, negated, then we translate it by, we substitute it by pi negated, which means it's not positive. So for instance, if we have x1 or not x3 or x4, it gets translated into uh, not n1 because n1 x1 is not negative, not p3 because um, 3 is not positive, and not n4 because um, x4 is not negative, it's positive, okay? So uh, the translation of these clauses, we see that all the variables are negated here. This will be a not very nice clause for us when we see implementations because it mixes Ns and Ps. Okay, we will talk about that later. Okay, so what else do we do? So we um, translate the clauses the way I said. Okay, and these clauses will be hard clauses. Okay, then we'll have another set of hard clauses, which are the ones that say a clause cannot, a variable cannot be positive and negative, not positive or not negative, okay? And, um, and finally, we have a set of soft clauses that are unit clauses, which are, you know, P1 up to PS and N1 up to NS. So we have two times S soft clauses, okay? So what are we gonna do with this? Okay, so they showed that uh, our original set of uh, clauses is satisfiable if and only if there is an assignment that satisfies all the hard clauses of the translation and n of the soft clauses, which means um, so the you know an assignment okay for the set of clauses is a set of the clauses, some of the clauses, some of the literals, excuse me, are positive, some of the literals are negative. So um, if we add the, the number of falsifies Ns and Ps is basically S, is the formula, if the formula is satisfiable, okay? So if this set of original clauses is unsatisfiable, okay, uh, then, um, Every assignment that satisfies all the hard clauses must falsify n plus one or n plus one sub clauses. Here the n is confusing while I was using s. So the original number of literal uh, of uh, variables, which was s previously plus one. Okay. So basically we're saying um, well that we cannot find an assignment, a coherent assignment for the for the original variables. Okay. So uh, proving unsatisfiability, okay, will turn into a, a partial max out problem because we have a set of hard clauses, a set of soft clauses, okay, and we must obtain now a set of empty clauses which corresponds to the number of original variables plus one, okay? All right, so here's an example, okay. We have the pigeonhole principle, um, which we all know, okay? We cannot uh, map in a one-to-one -one way n plus one pigeons into n holes. So we have two types of clauses, okay? 
the clauses that say that every pigeon must fly someplace, which is a disjunction. So pigeon I must fly to one of the end holes. And then here we're saying um, that not two pigeons can fly into the same hole. So either not I, the pigeon I doesn't fly to J or the pigeon K doesn't fly to J, J for, um, for I and K pigeons. And in this case, it would be J holes and J is in it, which is missing here. Okay. So we know that this principle has polynomial size refutations in Frege, extended the Frege in cutting planes, but it's hard for resolution. And in fact, uh, this is one of the principles where the solvers fail um, very badly. Okay. So when we translate it, okay, into this dual rail way, okay, we have the variables positive here. So now we have that we're saying they're not negative. So we have n literals here saying that pigeon i, for instance, goes, goes to some hole. Okay, so here I only have n variables. And in the whole um, clauses, I have the p variables because uh, those were negative. So <coughs> they're not positive, right? The p means positive, so they're not positive. So I have all my literals here neg negated and I can see that here with the pigeon clauses all I'm using is the n variables and here in the whole clauses all I'm using are the p variables okay so these turn into hard clauses and then I have the nijs and the pijs okay um, which will be the soft um, clauses okay so how many empty uh, clauses do I need or how many soft clauses do I need to falsify, which is equivalent, okay? Well, the number of original variables, which was n plus one times n plus one, okay? So this is the number of soft clauses that I need, that I will show that I need to have to falsify or the number of empty clauses that I need to produce, okay? So what is the general strategy so i um, i prepared this talk in a different way as previously you know i wanted to give you an idea for why this was working in um for some principles and what made other principles hard for this strategy okay so here i'm just giving you the pigeonhole principle again but um more spelled out somehow okay so here we have the pigeon one has to fly somewhere okay and uh, these are the variable the n variables that have to do with pigeon one and here okay so there are the same clauses for all the other pigeons up to the last one so the pigeon n plus one n plus well there's n sub n i'm sorry about this but I, you know, pigeonhole principle always do n plus one into n, and you know, I have n meaning negated variable, and it's really bad notation, but I hope you don't get too confused. Okay, so we're saying that the pigeon n plus one has to fly somewhere. Okay. And here are the soft clauses. Okay. And here I divided the, the whole clauses into the ones that talk about the whole one up to the ones that talk about the whole n, okay? The hard clauses and the soft clauses, okay? This is the set of hard clauses saying that only one pigeon basically flies, at most flies into whole one, and this last one would be, or, you know, that at most one pigeon will fly into whole n. So why am I giving you the pigeon hole principle in this shape? Well, because what I want to show you is that um, here, the variables are, it's, it's like I've broken the problem into pieces that have independent variables, disjoint variables, okay? So here I have the variables that talk about pigeon one and the variable n up to, you know, in each one of these pieces, you know, I have, for instance, here, all the variables that I'm using in this part are the variables that talk about n variables and the pigeon n plus one. Okay, here I have uh, the 
um, whole variables, which are p variables, okay? And in this case, I only talk about the whole one and so on, okay? So do you see how I've broken the problem into pieces that have these joint variables, okay? So I could solve these problems separately, right? And um, this is one thing that I can do because I have these two sets of variables. And, and I don't need to obtain um, proof of unsatisfiability, just a second. I don't need these clauses, okay? These clauses are very confusing and uh, not good for our, it, it, when we use them in the implementations, they, they slow things very much because they mix P and N variables, okay? And what we're trying to do or what is interesting about this encoding is that we can, it helps us break the problem into pieces with this joint variable. So solve a bunch of smaller problems rather than one big problem, okay? And I think this idea, maybe somebody can think of generalizing, modifying, whatever something with it, I don't know, okay? So, how do we prove that the pigeonhole principle is unsatisfiable? Okay, so we must prove um, uh, false uh, n times n plus one plus one soft clauses. Okay, so in for each one of the pigeons, we can generate uh, um, an unsatisfiability because here we're saying one of these has to be false, and here we're saying that all of them are true, basically. So we have an empty clause, say. Um, in each one of these n plus one groups, okay? And here, uh, basically we have the P clauses for say whole one. And here we're saying that at most uh, one pigeon goes into whole one, right? So this set, okay, uh, should produce um, n, uh, unsat you know, empty clauses or whatever or n soft clauses false, you know, because it's at most one of them that has to be true, right? So what do we get? For the first, for the pigeon clauses, we get n plus one falses, okay? And for the whole clauses, we have n sets, each one of them generates n falses, right? If we add this up, then we get, you know, the numbers that we want, right? So this is the general strategy, but what do we do? So we encode, okay? So using these two types of variables, we separate, um, well, we, we, in this case, we separated the pigeon clauses from the whole clauses very nicely. Uh, we have these disjoint variables. We try to solve them, the problems independently, okay? And, um, and then I, I will talk about the disadvantages in a minute. So then what do we do after we break the formula in pieces, okay? Well, uh, we can use max sad resolution, which I will define shortly, to obtain a total of uh, the number of, of original variables plus one empty clauses, or I can use any algorithm for max sad like core guided, Okay, or minimum heating set algorithms, etc. Okay, and try to solve this independent, this pieces. Okay, so what is the disadvantage? You know, the disadvantage is that, okay, when we mix the negative and the positive variables, things get very difficult um, and uh, it slows us down very much, right? In fact, for many, the problems that we've been coded and we've done experimentation on, um, if we could, um, okay, when we could uh, encode the clauses so that I, we only had either P variables or N variables, okay, we usually did need this, uh, this um, clauses, okay, so we could eliminate them and that made our experimentation much faster, okay, <clears throat> because they were not necessary. Okay, so how much time do I have, Antonina? Um, about three minutes, five minutes. Okay, so I don't know. Okay. Uh, 
Well, as I said, you know, you encode the formula with this in this other language, and you transform a satisfiability problem into a partial maxat problem. And one of the tools that you can use is maxat resolution, right? So this is a rule that is um, sound and complete for maxat, okay? And um, an important characteristic of this rule is that you don't add clauses, but you substitute clauses, for instance, here, okay? So I have X or A with weight one, it's a soft clause, and not X of B with weight one. And I substitute these two clauses, so I eliminate them and I introduce A or B with weight one and a collection of uh, weakenings of the initial clauses. So I lost the original clauses, okay, but I gained the, 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 the cut, okay, and some weakenings, okay, this is a set of clauses, but let's not bother with it now, and we can do it with uh, soft and hard clauses, etc. okay. So, um, well, this is an example, but there, in general, solvers don't use, don't use the, the maxat rule, it's like, you know, solvers for SAT don't use resolution per se, right? Um, uh, I think there is a, a solver that is called EVA or something like that that uses some form of uh, max hat resolution, but I'm not sure about how much of it, okay? Then there are other algorithms to solve um, max hat, okay, that uh, rely on iterative calls to SAT solvers, okay? And uh, ah, and I have a, an important point to make about maxat resolution. Okay, if we don't use if we don't use the the dual rail encoding, okay, before doing maxat inference, okay, pigeonhole principle is hard. There are lower bounds. So if you don't encode, so if you use the original variables and the original encoding, for instance, for the pigeonhole principle or anything that is hard for resolution, basically, you know, using the max rule, okay, obviously, it's not gonna help, okay, there are lower bounds, they're very easy to prove, okay. But with the dual rail encoding, uh, we can do a lot more. Okay, so back to the core guided algorithm. So what do we do? Uh, well, this is a, an algorithm based on iterative calls to a SAT solver. And we're um, here. I don't want to explain the details because I don't have much time. I want to just say a little bit about other things. But here, this lambda. Uh, so we have a working formula um, with soft and hard clauses. The lambda is how many soft clauses we must make unsatisfiable okay and uh, when we call the sat solver it says sat or unsat if it says sat then we output a satisfying assignment but we already we have also um a lower bound a number of soft clauses that must be falsified but but if it doesn't say sat Okay, we reconstruct the formula. Okay, we augment the number of uh, soft clauses that must be false. Okay, and um, uh, introduce, uh, substitute some clauses uh, by others with uh, first variables. And we have this uh, um, encoding of how many of them. Basically, here we're just giving an upper bound. You know, we're saying, okay, I let you falsify one more soft clause, but no more. See what you can do now, okay? Well, okay, so we can use this sort of algorithms, okay? But I wanted just to say very quickly, so where does this dual rail max hat, okay, uh, lie within other, you know, uh, propositional proof systems, right? So, Multiple dual rail max sat, which means that you might have several copies of the soft unit clauses, okay? But then you need to get more empty clauses, okay? This simulates three like resolution. If we make it weighted, okay? So you can have uh, many, uh, an exponential number, say, uh, encoded in binary, um, 
um, soft clauses and then need to generate many more empty clauses, then you can gener uh, simulate general resolution. Okay, and we don't know how to do it better than this. So we use dual ray max up with the core guided algorithm, then we can simulate resolution easily. Okay, so I'm not going to define the parity principle. Well, I'm just going to say what it is. Okay, so we have a graph with an odd number of vertices, and we're saying that it's not possible to have uh, every vertex with degree one. Okay, so okay so what did we prove about this um well so we showed also that ac0 frege bounded the frege plus the pigeonhole principle scheme p simulates dual rail maxat okay and um we also know that ac0 oops sorry we know that ac0 frege plus the pigeonhole principle um okay it requires exponential size to refute the parity principle, okay? So, um, so that means that here we have like a, a lower bound for the max set resolution with a dual rail, which means that we require exponential size with the parity principle, okay? Uh, this is with the, with max hat resolution, okay? And as a corollary, we obtain that um, dual rail max sat proof systems do not polynomially simulate cutting planes because they can do the parity principle efficiently. Okay, but uh, it's funny but that um, we can show theoretically and, and also with experimentation that with, if we use the minimum heating set algorithm uh, with the dual rail max sat encoding, and then we we have uh, efficient refutations of the of the parity principle. Um, well, I think I'm just oops. I guess I'm out of the time. I don't know, Antonina. You just said three minutes, but uh, I wanted to show some of the experimentation. But please, uh, just, please, huh? please do please show. Excuse me. Let's make it into a question. Can you show us the experiments? Uh, okay, I just, I mean, I have experiments in some other places, but this is, okay, I, and I didn't define it. This is uh, the double, I just took one one graphic, you know, for the double pigeonhole principle. The reason I did this is because it's harder for than the pigeonhole principle. It's also difficult for a solution, obviously. Okay, it's, we have two M plus one pigeons and M holes. And we say that uh, we cannot place them with at most two pigeons in one hole, okay? And uh, so this, this pigeonhole principle, this double pigeonhole principle, for instance, we can, we can show refutations efficiently with, um, with uh, the dual rail max at resolution, okay? And uh, here we see, see, we have we did experimentation with a bunch of solvers. The first thing that I need to tell you is that this ones that have the prime, it means that they don't have the clauses that mix the P's and the N variables. When we say that not PI or not NI, okay, which we don't need to do the refutation, okay. So if we eliminate those clauses, then we get. Um, much faster uh, results, you know, uh, than, than when we leave the, the, the not PI or not NI clauses. Okay, so there's a huge difference in the size of the instances that we can solve. Okay. And uh, here below, we have um, SAT basic SAT algorithm, uh, uh, conflict-driven class learning. This is uh, max SAT. Um, so these are mixed of SAT and max SAT tools, okay? But with, uh, and these are, these are here, 
with the clauses that mix the P's and the N's. And these are the results for basically um, core guided. Eva is the one that I think has the, the max set resolution, okay, but with the dual rail, these are minimum heating set, this and this, etc. So what we see here is that if we use um, SAT algorithms, there's no chance we can solve these instances. If we use the dual rail um, and any algorithm, but we leave the clauses that mix the ends and the P's, we don't get res good results either. We get good results when, when we eliminate those clauses that mix the ends and the P's, okay? And use the, the dual rail encoding with the with the tools to solve partial maxat, basically, you know, this is just an example. That's it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So, questions, comments. Did you check? Did you check how does it scale the function of m? Uh, did you check how does it? What well, it just so distorted that it's hard to hear. I, uh, how does it scale? How does it scale as a function of m? As a function of m. Yeah, yeah. You're showing just instance number, but here you can actually generate instances where with increasing m, mm -hmm. and see how does it scale as a function of m. Well. So, your best solver, I mean, how does it scale? Yeah, I suppose uh, it would show a similar, uh, I don't know. I mean, we haven't done that experimentation, but I suppose, why do you think it would show something, you know, show something more or extra? Well, because one of the things, for example, are we, are they, do they all scale exponentially, but with different exponents, okay? Uh -huh. Or different bases, if you want, of the exponent. Yeah. The c to the n, but with a smaller c. So it's not. I mean, there is a dramatic difference between your best, your best performing, and your worst performing. Yes. And scalability would at least tell us is you know are we are we what what are we improving here? Are we improving it in a multiplicative way? Are we improving it in an exponential way? Yeah. Well. Is it, uh, is Albert is saying, is, is number of instances, is it, is it the same as M? What is it the same as M? I didn't understand the last bit, you know. Number of instances. Number of instances. Because you can just, you can just, you can just kind of take the problem and generate, permute it randomly. It's another way to generate more instances. I lose your voice in the middle of it. Anyway, we'll follow, we'll follow offline. So, so um, I've got a separate question. Um, you know, at some level, this you're counting the number of falsified, uh, number, number of true literals that you require, number of falsified literals, you're doing a mm -hmm. count of that relative yes. to the total number of, of uh, variables. Um, which is sort of, you know, gives that intuition. So it's actually surprising. What, do you have any intuition as to what your, what your system is doing outside of AC0 Frege things? In turn, there's a, some form of reduction to a pigeonhole principle like property going on. Do you have an intuition of how with maximum hitting set you're actually, uh, you're getting around that? Well, maximum heating said it's a whole different story for me, you know, <sighs> because, uh, you know, I mean, you're calling is like the, the sad solver, it's played to the minimum, and what really plays a role there is the, the calculation of minimum heating set, okay? And I guess this solvers yours. Um, um, Oh, what is it called? Uh, Cplex or things like this, right? So uh, I wanna I wanna turn off turn this off so that I can see the faces of people, <laughs> you know. Uh, and I don't know how to do it, you know. Oh, now, now, just a second. I'm gonna minimize it because I'm talking yeah. to you guys and. 
no. unshare, unshare is where you're going to get your Yeah, but I'm... Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Stop oh, sharing the red, uh, whatever is red on your Stop screen. Stop sharing, yeah. Okay, now, I couldn't see who I was talking to. Okay, so who was asking me a question? Now? Yeah, it was, it was I me. I don't see some faces. It was Paul, but me. So um, before it was Moshe, and now, now, it's, now it's me. Ah, okay, Paul, now I see you. Okay, <laughs> yes. Okay, again, yeah. So, yeah, so the, right. So the, the, the thing is, is, is it because, you know, hitting set is this very hard problem and you're assuming that you, you know, for that polynomial time that you actually are getting a solution to that potentially hard problem? Or uh, is that why you're getting polynomial time? I mean, it's just surprising that it's sort of going beyond what it, an AC0 Frege essentially reduction in some sense to uh digital principle or is there something else uh, yeah something well uh, yeah the thing is that when you use these encodings uh and and you see when you're breaking the problem into pieces you know it's like the the unsatisfiable course are very easy to obtain and and then everything is played in the finding of the minimum heating sets you know and using other tools that have nothing to do with uh say resolution or i see i oh sure yeah of course makes sense yeah Oops. may i also ask a quick question um so it seems to me uh, that it's hard uh, to okay. comb to combine your is it far, to, to combine your approach with um, this modeling you understand what i mean namely um so you're solving now like a big problem we want to solve the pitchable problem, but nobody's interested in solving the pitchable problem. We, we know uh, what is true or false. Well, not necessarily, not only the pigeonhole principle, you know. Yeah. But, but I was thinking, yeah. um, so of this modeling. So in modeling, pigeonhole, form, pigeonhole formulas are used uh, injectivity, surjectivity, all different constraints and, and the mm -hmm. like. So it's quite, you actually quite use them. But now with your approach, it seems to be at the moment at least very intrusive. You had to reformulate the whole, your whole SAT problem if you just want to mm -hmm. use this little pigeonhole formula in it. And um, so that seems to be quite a stumbling block for, uh, for, for uh, you have to use a maxat solver and have to reformulate the whole, your whole problem into that formula, as it seems to me. Some thoughts on that or? Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but as I said, you know, I mean, in the cases where I have clauses that only have either positive or negative literals, you know, like even parity, you know, even though we cannot do it with uh, core guided algorithms uh, efficiently so far, we don't know how to do it. Uh, but I think subset cardinality also has the same shape. So we don't, when we don't mix, mix positive and negative, you know, uh, and we manage to break the problem into this. Um, so formulas that have uh, these joint variables, you know, it it helps, right? Um, you think for some special I don't know. Cases. Maybe some yeah, well. people have an idea of how when you mix variables, how to do it so that re-encode so that this doesn't happen. I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't know. It has this limitation. The 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 method right but um it works for some principles you know thank you okay thank you very very much maria